Hey, Composing Gloves here, and today we are going to be talking about, you guessed it, Fruity Reverb 2, how'd you know? And this is in the FL12 FX series. So Reverb is one of my favorite things, probably one of your favorite things. I just love it. You slap it on stuff. If you're doing sound design, it makes it sound more real. But there are some things you should know, like, for example, the general controls in a Reverb plugin. These are quite common controls. We've got this arrow down here that appears, but you can't, oh, you can make that disappear. Oh, that's an interesting feature. So you have this spinning sort of graphic thing. The first time when I was getting started in FL, I had no clue what this did. I was opening up mixes from like the projects that came with it. And I, I just thought, I thought this was like some magic plugin because the graphic would glow when the song played. And I was like, what does, what is this doing? And blew my mind. So uh, I'm going to cover, there are a few more advanced concepts with this, shockingly, as far as reverb goes. This plugin is extraordinarily flexible, and I it's a computative reverb, so it takes in the signal, computes what a reverb would sound like with that, generates reflections, and spits it out. There are three kinds of reverb, or there's there's two kinds of reverb. There's There's not three. I guess there's real reverb, which is, I guess, if you want to count that as a separate one, but there are two kinds. There's convolution reverb which I will talk about when I talk cover the Fruity Convolver. And there is computative reverb. So this is computative. And it has some really nifty options that are actually really cool um, for FL. So first, we should probably talk about this mixer. So we have the dry sound. So if I play some notes, you can hear the reverb. Without the reverb, you know, you, you don't get nothing. But with reverb... So this can tend to muddy up your signal. Now, something you need to be aware of, and this is just a mixing 101, is everything is essentially volume. Like if you consider your sample rate, your sample rate is sampling a volume at a particular rate. And so when any kind of modulation is going to do something with volume, everything is volume, like everything. Like the more I think about it, the, like the crazier I get, like everything is volume. And so you got to keep that in mind that you're just adding volume at a really uh, a somewhat random pattern that decays. I guess it's not random. It decays over time, but random reflections coming from all these different angles at all these different phases, and it generates this thing we call reverb. And so it's important to know that. So this can muddy up a mix super quick. Like you should already know that, but I want you to be extra aware of that because it's got some options that could help rectify what's going on here. So we have this dry mix. This is the amount of signal that comes in. So if we turn off, okay, I guess it's better to do this. So we have er and wet. So I guess it's like wet to er. I don't know what the, because uh, the er is before the wet. So I'm not sure how this works. But dry is unprocessed signal. Wet is processed signal. So right now we have nothing. If we turn this off, it actually, I'm playing notes right now, but it's effectively muted our channel. So that's an important note. You can alt click any one of these things to reset it to default. You have this er. So the way reverb works is uh, you're in a room and you say something. You go like, composing gloves is amazing. Like I, I know that's something you just scream in your room by yourself. And what happens is you, the sound from your voice hits a wall and it bounces back. And it will bounce around, like the first one will bounce and it will hit your ear. And that's called the first reflection because it reached you by definition first. This is generally a, uh, a delay. This is what you would associate with a delay. If that happens so fast that like within milliseconds, you will actually won't hear the first reflection. And, and I don't know if that's technically considered not a first reflection anymore, but that's called temporal fusion when one wave mixes with the other wave and it actually creates... A weird phase perception but and then of course it will continue bouncing around your room and occasionally reverb these reflections that are bouncing off your room will reach your ears and there will be a point where there's so many of these reflections because it's bounced so many times and it's sort of it splits because when sound hits a surface it can do any number of things it can go through that surface it can uh, split it can bend around things and this is all frequency dependent and you're spewing frequencies at it. And there's two types of reflections that can happen really. There's, so when you, when you speak at a wall, 
or speaking of a wall, when you when you make a noise and it hits the surface, you can have reflection. And I, I I have someone, one of my instructors has compared it to light, and I like that analogy a lot. So you look in the mirror and you see a reflection of yourself, and it resembles you. You look like you. But at the same time, you could be in a room with a white wall, and that white wall could be reflecting light just the same, but it in no way reflects like an image of a wall. It's being diffused it's being dispersed and it doesn't resemble the original content and so when we have reverb in a room it's a there's a mix of these types of uh things going on and there's a whole bunch more to this whole mess but to, to the basic understanding this er affects your first affects the first reflections and this can have a big impact on stereo image and basic delay, what you think about is going on with delays. So this can be used to help with stereo imaging. Like you can hear it. Like I don't know, you can hear that buzzing. Let me turn it off. That's the er. This is the wet. So these are the early reflections. So maybe that's what it was. Early er, early reflections. I, I don't know. So anyways, that's what that's all about. That was a long explanation, but I want you to wrap your head. I don't want this to be a tutorial you walk away and go, oh, that's what those knobs do. I want this to be one where you're like, oh, man, I that's what reverb is. And so hopefully that's opened up your eyes to some of these things, that these stereo image things, these are important decisions. And then occasionally I just end up tweaking knobs without really thinking because of old habits. I just turn things up because in the past I've gotten good results when I turn things up in certain orders. And that's fine to an extent, but if I'm being if I want to be specific and achieve a really true clean mix that's intentional, you're gonna want to be aware of things like this. Okay, so that was like the longest explanation ever. And then we have this wet. This wet is the late reflections. This is what you would generally associate with reverb. And you notice we have a mix of the original tone, but it's also been diffused. You can you can control this diffusion using the diffusion knob over here. So you see diffusion, what it's doing, and it makes a lot of sense given what we just said. You can actually go down to a, uh, I don't want to say this is a pyramid, a triangle, whatever. I'm just going to call it a triangle. I don't even care. So it goes in and it hits around these walls. And so it diffu its diffusion is quite a bit different. If you were standing in a room shape like this versus a room, it essentially is a circle. So it has no parallel walls. Everything just keeps bouncing and ideally continuously. And so that's something you need to be aware of. Now, up until this point, I have not pointed out the stereo image you are currently dealing with. And you might be going, what are you talking about? There's more mumbo jumbo. And yeah, there is. When you're applying reverb to a signal, you can't ignore the fact that you're dealing with a stereo signal or a mono signal. They, these are very important. In FL, one of the things that I really like and at the same time feel like this could do a lot of damage to newer people is the fact that all your channels are stereo faders. This is like something I just don't see in other DAWs because this is... It's not that intuitive when you're recording something in mono and you have a stereo fader reacting. It's just weird. And so it presents issues that are unique to FL in some ways. But anyways, you're dealing with a stereo image. So if you right now, we've got this mid side button. Now I've got a mid side tutorial up that explains mid side, sets up the routing and explains some of the mixing positions on this. Because there are creative uses for this, and those are easy. Those are easy to figure out. It's the mixing ones. When you understand the mixing ones, you'll be able to make even more wildly creative decisions. So go check out that mid side tutorial because I'm not going to explain what mid side is. But you can't and go there if you don't understand what I'm talking about with stereo image as well. You need to go there for that too because I explain some of it there. I intend to do a whole mixing series at some point that because too many. I've seen just too many decisions being made out of pure unknowledge about basics of sound and how it interacts and audio of uh, psychoacoustics and stuff so anyways you can choose to process your mid or your side this is something that's really unique to fl so if you go to side and i hit some notes there is like no reverb and but if i go to the mid you might be going like what and that's because we've been ignoring our stereo image right now this is a mono source but i can by activating the unison I can make this, if I turn, uh, I want to turn this reverb off. I can make this a stereo source. 
So now it's got stereo spread. There's stuff happening on both sides because I have my panning turned on over here. There's a whole bunch of ways to turn something into stereo. Now this technically isn't true like stereo. Like this isn't an actual acoustic space. This is like fake stereo. It's being synthesized stereo. Sort of like how this is synthesized reverb. It's not real reverb. It's just trying to emulate something. So this is helping giving us a sense of space. Well, now if I turn it on to side and I turn it on, we will have some reverb. So that's really unique. If we go to mid, you'll notice it sounds a bit more mushy, a bit more blurry. Let me turn the er uh up so we get all the, all the reverb on everything. And I'll go back to side. And now to the mid. Now, of course, you're saying, oh, but your wet setting is up so much. But there is a noticeable difference. And this becomes really important when you're mixing. These are important decisions to make because you can put a lot more on the side. Um, and so because you know what mid-side is because you went and watched that video, you can put a lot more emphasis, a lot more reverb. You can do a lot more EQ and all sorts of things to the side versus the mid where... Uh, you, you're you going to muddy up your sound. Side, you can get away with just a ton more. And you can give a lot more space, a lot more big sense. Now, this is also, you also need to be aware that if you process your reverb inside and then you compress it down to mono, it's essentially going to disappear when you combine it because the phases will cancel out and you'll have no reverb anymore. And so, actually, the reverb should combine and it'll get louder uh, with a mid-side configuration. So I guess that's still okay. But if you're using like a space pair microphones to record but we're not doing that we're doing a mid-side so ignore ignore that you shouldn't have a problem but know that if you process it inside when you when you bring it down to mono it'll still sound really good but you're going to have some unusual peaks there so if you're mixing and a lot of people you know are going to be listening to on like single speaker systems you need to be aware of that most of the time they're going to be listening to in stereo stereo is the, by far the most popular thing we've got going on right now so and no one like listens to their phone and expects it to sound like amazing. So you, I encourage you to make decisions in stereo with consciousness so that you don't destroy your mono image, that you still have one for when you want to play it over your phone. But like you want it to sound the best it can on the best system, like the system people are actually going to be listening to it for quality's sake. So, uh, so that's that. That's mid side. Now on the diffusion. Again, we have all these, we've, we've talked about this. And so with this knowledge, you can actually control the size of the space. So if you have a big space, it's going to take a lot longer. If you're like in a cathedral, you have, first off, you're going to have a lot more bass response because bass frequencies are huge. They're, they're enormous. They're like uh, a frequency of like 20 hertz is something like 50 feet long or 52. I forgot exact 54. I forgot exactly what it was, but it's, it's huge. And so in a big room, a bass frequency can fully develop and bounce off a wall. So you'll get a very different bass response and just everything will be very different. Your mix will sound way different because of the acoustics. So this combined with your diffusion can give you a wide range of reverbs. And of course, your dry and wet mixes change this as well. So it's a big room. Here's a small room. And you see that we get that, we get resonant peak buildups here. This is, I think it actually simulates, well, these these appear to be some parallel surfaces somewhat. So, uh, so you get that. And it's important to note that in a room, you also have a floor and a roof. And they don't have an option to add different angled roofs. But that would be outrageously cool. There are reverbs out there that do that. So anyways, that is that. Hopefully you have some ideas of how to create spaces and you... You got some ideas on how to do this in a way that won't ruin a mix. So once you have this, now let's talk about some basic things. So you have, let's turn the wet way up. I want this to just be really noticeable. And so you have this decay. De the, so the decay time is the amount of time it takes for any single reflection for, well, I guess this is an entire decay time. So it takes the amount of time for the reverb to decay below 60 decibels. That is like the definition of decay time that is understood. At least that's what it stands for in the analog world. So or they'll call it the RT 
release time. And so that's what that is. So this is that's essentially what the decay is. So you can see over here, they actually have a, it tells you this is 8.5 seconds to that point. And so you could have really, that's a 12 seconds. That's like a long time. Like a really freaking long time. So if we do this. And so you can adjust your decay. The reason I'm talking about this and I'm going around these knobs in an order is just because there's certain things that just seem to flow better when I'm talking about this. So if we come over here to our high cut and our low cut, these are filters. If you don't know what a high cut and low cut is, they're essentially a high cut is basically the same thing as a low pass filter and a low cut is the same thing as a high pass filter. Now, if you don't know what that is, go watch my filter basics video. That's all I'm going to say about that. After that, you should know what these things do. So... We turn the high cut up and we can adjust our our frequency cutoff as you can see up here we could we can see what is going on here so if we're gonna now i do not want to high cut it i actually want my high end to be there i want some sparkle i want to low cut it and so i want to take out some of that base i want to cut up to like five not three thousand like five five hundred oh what the heck's going on here I was looking at the five as if it wasn't even there. Okay, so there's 500. And I, I chose that pretty specifically just because I know that's where the higher end starts to appear. Should cut out pretty much all my bass. A good deal of the bass. Probably uh, not the diffusion. I want the size. Not the size. I want, well, a smaller room would also help in this case. I want my low cut. I'll bring it up to a thousand. That's, that was, that's pretty high. So you see, we get that high end. There's not that low mud. If I put it down here in placement notes now, I get that low mud. And you might be saying, that sounds beautiful. And that might that's true. I think it sounds great. But if you know anything about mixing, you know that that area is freaking bloodlust for bass and other, your kick. Most, almost every instrument has something that resonates down there. And you're going to want that open. So I recommend cutting if you don't need it. And I like that high end sparkle. You may be going for the other way around. Maybe you've got a really bass and you want to cut the highs. And have a high cut. That might be a decision you have. Like, I don't know. So I, I personally, I tend, I tend to do this just because I have that knowledge, which is not necessarily a good thing. So you might not want to do that. I generally do this. Actually, most of the time I'm making creative decisions and I do it because I know what it's going to sound like. So that low end can sound really great in solo mode. So you might consider automating this. Um, okay, so we have this pre-delay. So in a room, a really big room, realistically, when you scream or yell, I'm going to assume you're screaming because that's what you do when you go into big rooms. You scream. If you didn't know that, that's what you're, that's what you're supposed to do. Um, when you get into a room and you scream you're going to have reflections but it's going to take a while for them to get to you especially in a big room so you can activate pre-delay and when we hit our notes that's pretty cool right and so that's just delay uh, to simulate the amount of time it would actually take to get to you you can adjust this yourself i recommend automating things like this subtly because you're not going to be standing in the same place. You're not going to automate that much. And there's ways of automating things by only like a few percent or two. You might be going like, dude, you're going nuts with your delay thing. But I'm telling you, that's important. Now, if you turn on this T, this turns into ratio. So, and these are in ratio to the, temp, to the tempo of your song. So if you go up to four, this is essentially quarter notes. So it'll come in one beat after we play. So... Now, these ratios are given in the manual, but this is a quarter note. This is uh, eighth note. So you can use this to create. Now, this is something I like. I don't think I've, I've ever seen, but I don't see like people don't like come up and show me their projects all the time. So I don't know, but you can tempo sync your pre-delay, which is freaking cool. You can make an ARP with maybe a delay on it already. And you might have a much shorter a much shorter decay time and maybe make it very wet and even then let's let's just let it all out let's just have um no high cut so all the way up is off you can see it up there and on the low cut it's the other way so these are kind of unusual in that you need to know which way they need to be to have them off and so we could even turn this down 0.1 of a second that's really short
So if you're like in a future base, that's a, that's a trick that you might not know about. That's a thing, a technique you're probably going to want to know. So we have our size. We already talked about this diffusion. Okay, so we only really have a few more knobs to talk about here. You might be going like, oh my gosh, this is the craziest. You get you talk too much in this video. I could see that happening. <laughs> I just want to be specific. There's other videos out there if you want to know what freaking knobs do. So we have bass. So base frequencies can, this is essentially a base multiplier band and you can see like the percent. And so you can make your base resonate more let's, if you really wanted to. And so let's turn our decay time up. You see it adjusts the decay time over our base. So you could, now I do recommend automating these things because those low ends sound really nice and full and lush and that's how it would sound in acoustic space. You don't have like an EQ to randomly get rid of something. Usually EQs are used to fix recording problems, not the way something really sounds in a room. Unless you're making, you know, a track that's not supposed to sound like that in a room. You don't want it to sound like it's in that room. So, but you can make it really bassy and this is the contrast. And then uh, this boost happens at the crossover point you select here. So. I, I don't believe I've talked about crossover points in any video. I think I can reference super fast. So I'll just talk about it really quick. So in speaker systems, you often see this all the time. You'll see they have crossovers. So they'll have a band and let's just, just pretend that this is like a whole separate band and this is a band. This point in the middle is a crossover. And so here's our low end spectrum, our high end spectrum. And you're essentially, when you move the crossover, you're selecting where this goes. And what and this controls the crossover point for this bass boost. So anything on this side of the bass boost gets a big boost. Like it gets boosted and as reverb. And this stuff doesn't. So if you turn this down, you'll get a tiny bass boost at a specific frequency. I'm not sure where the cutoff is. It's probably like 20 hertz or something. So uh, just so you know, that's a thing. And so you can use this to create a boost to your whole mix. You can go all the way up to 20K. So I don't recommend doing that, um, but you could do this. A uh, request of image line ever sees this is it'd be cool to have an inverse so that you could boost your trebles instead. Usually you end up you, they have a dampening one here because normally that's what you end up doing and you can always just use an EQ So I guess it's not it's not like that crazy It'd be cool to have a pitch shift option for the reverb on here That's one that that would be cool to see on here. All right, so the dampening factor. What is this? Well, your high ends are often It's essentially a crossover, but oftentimes your high end is just too much for reverb You'll run into that trust me you will and so you can dampen it and in a real space High frequencies will die off faster than low ones. Low ones tend to hang around. So uh, so this is part of it just sounding like the way we are accustomed to hearing reverb. So uh, if we hit notes, if we have a high dampening factor, uh, which this is off, but if we have a high, this is a, well, this is a cutoff value. You actually can't control the dampening, but you can. So it's the same thing as this, as the EQ I had. Where did I put that EQ? There it is. It's the same thing as this, only everything on this side. So this is essentially the dampening factor. You're picking a separate frequency for this. And they're saying everything on this side gets cut. It's like it gets it gets lowered. So this gets lowered some amount. And that's that's just the way we're used to hearing sound in a space. We're not used to having high stuff just hang around for ages unless you have a weird room with resonant problems. <laughs> So that's a low, a low, so this is like really low. And you can hear the amount of attenuation. I'm not sure if it's a curve, like, like it gets more severe at the farther away it is or what the deal is. I, that's what it sounds like, sort of. It doesn't, it sounds like a shelf with some sort of a slight um, curve in it. That's what I hear anyways. But if we turn it up. That's no dampening factor and you hear that extra high end wish that could be so let me play that one more time listen for that high end sort of sparkle it sounds like the ocean wave crashing thing it'd be this is something we'd probably need an oversampling filter to to avoid aliasing but um on that on that type of a thing uh that'd be useful for like a riser or something like a, an impact sound you don't want a lot of damping you could use that as like one of those 
like those wind sample things. But you could do it using reverb, which would be derived from your original sample, which would be really cool. So as you see, not super intuitive for playing. And so we could use our side and we could turn this up, turn the decay way up. And as you see, that sounds pretty cool. Now we get all this mud. We don't necessarily want all that mud. And I don't want the time, I don't want the pre-delay on. I only have a little 25 key in front of me. I'm a I'm a piano player and I use the full range. Like that's I'm a I'm a stride player, so I jump. I like jumping. I like doing that kind of. That's my thing. That's I. So the little 25 keys will feel a little restricted, but I like the size of the keyboard. So if you have any questions, drop in the comments. Oh, you're probably gonna ask me what this knob does. This is your stereo separation knob. Uh, it does not affect your dry signal, just so you know. And what this does is it stereo separates your signal. So if I put it in the middle here, so you can hear it being stereo separated into your right and left. I'm not sure because it's got negative percentage to positive percentage. This isn't like a panning knob. This is different. So I'm not sure if these are two separate cues. I couldn't find anything on this. I didn't look that hard though because I'm not sure if it uses the timing cue or the intensity cue to get the panning effect. Um, so I'm not sure what it's doing here. Uh, but you can use this to create uh, stereo. And you can always check it with a mid-side matrix to make sure that it is doing exactly what you want. I suppose that's the long way of me going about this. So you see it says stereo separation when you hover over it. And so that's the long way of sort of figuring out what it does if you really want to be sure and make sure your song is mono compatible. And so as you can see, I haven't done that. So, But that's another way of making your reverb not muddy up your sound. And it can be a very useful knob. So yeah, if you have any questions, again, drop them in the comments. Now that now that that is not one of them, subscribe and have a blessed day.